Well, let's take our Bibles, please, at this time and turn to the epistle to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. A few years ago, I was over in Greece and able to uh, visit Athens and Corinth, and I saw signs, road signs, that said Thessalonica. And I thought, wow, it's still there. It's just north in the region of Turkey today. But at the time of the Apostle Paul, it was not a good place to live. It was a place of persecution. In fact, the Apostle Paul basically got run out of Dodge. He only had three weeks to be there, but he did establish a New Testament church there. And so he's writing back to them, and, and they were really going through it so much so that they thought they were in the tribulation period. Paul had taught him about that, and Paul had to reassure him, no, this isn't it. This isn't it at all. And then he gives them some things that would help them and encourage them, and I'd like to share them with you today. Just one thought, especially, and that is the thought of giving thanks, in everything giving thanks. You find that in our passage here in 1 Thessalonians 5. We begin reading in verse 16. It says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Let's back up to verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We're going to be talking about that today as we talk about in everything give thanks. Let's pray before we begin. Father, we thank you now for just the privilege to be here. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for the New Testament church. We thank you for the chance to serve you at this time in history and reach our generation. And Father, we thank you for this particular service and ask you now to meet with us here in a special way and help us to leave with grateful hearts. We pray and ask it all now in Jesus' name. Amen. In the hour before this one, we have a, a Bible class and we're studying lessons and legends. And these are greats of the Bible. And boy, I was blessed this morning as we studied the life of Job. Job was a man who probably suffered more than anyone else next to the Lord Jesus Christ. Job lost his children all in one swoop, ten kids. He lost his livelihood all in one swoop. He lost his health. And he was sitting in the, the city ash heap trying to find some relief for the, the boiling sores on his, on his body and, and lamenting, like, what's going on? What's happening here? Why am I suffering so? And it goes on for dozens of chapters. But in all that time, we find a man who, who retains his integrity spiritually and his faith in God and continues in the midst of all his adversity to be thankful to be thankful. What a testimony to us. We find as all that was going on in, in Job's life that he didn't understand, there was actually this, this, this high level battle going on between God and the devil. And God was orchestrating everything that was taking place there as he today in the 21st century is orchestrating everything that takes place in your life. Sometimes we don't understand the suffering and the trials and the tribulations and we ask why and what. But God is behind all that. God is orchestrating all that. I call that the unseen hand. That's what the songwriter called it. The unseen hand of God in the midst of all that. Continually working. As those things unfold and as we go through the valleys, so seldom do we, we stop to acknowledge God or even, even thank God for the trials. But if you're going through a trial today or if you've been through a trial recently, can you thank God for that? If you go through a trial in the near future or the distant future, can you thank God for that? The verse says, in everything give thanks, even for the hard times. Let's read it again. Verse 18 says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, Pastor Weiss here has recently been talking about the will of God. You say, I want to know the will of God. Well, here's part of it right here. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to scratch our heads. The Bible tells us in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So we're going to be talking about that. In everything give thanks. We see first of all what I call the initiation of this. The initiation. We're told here to do it. We're told here to, to give God thanks. Now look back in Psalm 50 if you would. And let's look at a few psalms here that talk about the initiation of being thankful. We find here a psalm written um, by the sweet, sweet psalmist. 
we find here him talking about being thankful. And he says something here that I want to hone in on. It's verse number 14 of Psalm 50, which says, Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. It speaks of offering something up to God. It speaks of paying a vow unto God, kind of like we owe a debt. And, and maybe we're even in arrears of this debt. But are we thankful to God? Because we should be. We have so much to be thankful for. You say, well, but pastor, you don't know my situation. It's different from other people. Things aren't going well for me. In fact, things are going pretty bad. Well, let me share a verse with you. In Hebrews 13 and in verse 15, it says, Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Now, it doesn't say we, we offer up praise and we give thanks when everything's going okay, when the cupboards are full, when the kids are healthy, when the job is going great, when, when the, the marriage is wonderful, and, and everything's just wonderful. We say, ain't God good, but what about when things are going bad? What about when the wheels fall off? What about when we, re, we, we receive these setbacks in life? It says here in Hebrews 13, 15, therefore... Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Now, when something's a sacrifice, it, it's hard to do, right? It, it puts you out. It's not, it's not easy, but, but you do it anyway. And here we're told, let us therefore offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That means when it's not easy. That means when things aren't going well. But notice the next word, continually. Continually. And then it mentions that it is the fruit of of our lips giving thanks to his name. You're in the Psalms here. Turn back to Psalm 35. We ought to be thankful to God privately. And, and that's something I make a point of doing in my devotional time every morning, having a time of thanks, even listing things that I'm thankful for. We ought to be thankful to God privately, but we also ought to be thankful to God publicly. And we find here in Psalm 35, notice with me, if you would, verse 18. The psalmist says, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Now, here's David. And by the way, he's known as the sweet psalmist. And he's the one who wrote a lot of the psalms. And he's also known as a man after God's own heart. There's no question as you study the Bible, he's special. One of the greatest men in the Bible, mentioned over 900 times, more than any other person in the Bible except Jesus Christ. What made him so special? What made him a, a man after God's own heart? Well, as you read through the Psalms, you cannot miss this, that David was thankful. David was thankful to God. And we, we see him thanking God once again. Notice he says in verse 18, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. You know, we call this a, a worship service, and it is, but really what this is is a thanksgiving service. We assemble like this on the Lord's Day to give thanks to God, as he says here, in the great congregation and amongst much people. We ought to have public thanksgiving, and that really is our worship. It is so important. In fact, in the Old Testament, they actually appointed ministers for this specific thing, if you can imagine that. We read back in 1 Chronicles 16.4, that he, David, appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. What a job. <laughs> what a position. Imagine, that's your position, is to thank God and praise God. Can you imagine how the faces of these ministers glowed as they did this? They did this really as a ministry. We read in First Chronicles 23 and verse 30, and to stand every morning and to thank and praise the Lord, and likewise at evening. Here's the initiation of it. Here's the exhortation of it. Here's the admonition to do it. We are to be thankful. We see the initiation. But secondly, let's look at the illustrations. There's a lot of examples in the Bible. There's a lot of even secular examples of Christians in modern days who were great models of, of prayer and thanksgiving. Look, if you would, in Revelation chapter 11. Let's look at some of these illustrations of thankfulness. And, and I want you to think about this as you're turning to the last book of the Bible. As I speak today, what's going on in heaven? What are they doing up there? Well, I can tell you what they're doing up there. 
They're thanking the Lord. They're praising the Lord. This stuff goes on 24-7. Even as I speak, we find here in Revelation 11, notice these verses in verse 16. It says, In the four and twenty elders, those are a picture of the saints, of the believers, which sat before God on their seats, fell on their faces, and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Notice what they're doing in heaven right now. They're thanking God. They're thanking God. That's going to go on throughout all eternity, this business of thanking God. Turn back to chapter 4, if you would. So if they're doing it in heaven, how about us practicing, okay? If you're going there, should we be warming up a little bit in this world and, and in this life with going through our lives as believers with a thankful attitude, a, an attitude of gratitude? Notice here in Revelation chapter 4, and we pick it up in verse 9. It says, and when those beasts, speaking of angelic beings, cherubims and cherubims, and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders, picture of us again, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. But as you back up to verse 9, you notice this giving of thanks once again. It's going on around the clock, I believe, up in heaven, even right now. Can we be thankful to God upon this earth? You say, but pastor, I'm, I'm going through it. I, I mentioned that. I, I, I'm going through the mill. How can I thank God at such times? Well, really what we have then, folks, is a conditional attitude of gratitude, a conditional thanksgiving. That doesn't please the Lord. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. God wants us to trust him no matter what. We have a guy in the Bible by the name of Daniel. And Daniel really heard of this decree that, that was signed that, that was his death warrant. It was a death decree for him. He knew what it meant if he kept doing what he did. But we find in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10 that when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened and his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a fourth time. Now that would cost him in the end nearly his life, certainly would have normally cost him his life, but he thanked God anyway. Folks, the point is this. When things are going wrong, when the wheels are falling off in life, when everything seems to be caving in, that's when we really need to be thanking God and thanking Him regardless of what the outcome might be. It's called faith. Back in the 1800s in, in Bristol's England, there was a, a man who had been gloriously saved as a teenager by the name of George Mueller. He was a rebel from Bristol until God saved him. And after God saved him, he went on to do great things for God. He was mostly known for his life of prayer, though he ran orphanages and, and housed and fed and clothed thousands of, of uh, little ragamuffins there in England during his day. There was one time when uh, they had eaten supper there in the orphanage, and the workers, the staff, came to George Mueller and said, that was it. That was all the food we have. We just fed them the last drop, the last crumb, and there's nothing for breakfast in the morning. Mueller went to bed that night trusting God. The next day got up and he told his staff and workers, he said, assemble the children, bring them in and sit them at the table like we're ready to eat. They thought that was odd, so they all came in. They sat down, plates were sitting there, everything was ready to be served. And Mueller said, kids, we don't have any food here in the orphanage at all, but we have a God who has all the food and, and we trust him, don't we? And so we're going to pray and ask him to provide food for us and we're going to even thank him before we get the food. And certainly, Mueller began to pray and thank God for the food he's going to provide that day. And, and once you know it, there's a knock on the door. And it's, it's a peddler on his way going to market who uh, had this large ca uh, cart full of, of bread and, and eggs and other things. And, and it had broken down right outside the orphanage there. And he said, I had to get this to market. He said, but it's going to spoil if I don't just do something with it. Could you use it here? Could you imagine that? And Mueller passed the test. God is looking for faith when it comes time to thank him, and it's hard to do. We find these illustrations of thankfulness. I think of the Apostle Paul. Now, here's Paul 
and he was, I mean, just basically everywhere he went, whipped and beat up and thrown in jail and, and, and shipwrecks and, and, and whipping posts and all this stuff going on as he served God faithfully in the ministry. And it would have been enough, do you think, to sour anybody, but not Paul. We find in 1 Timothy 1.12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. He was thankful for all that he had to go through. He was thankful for his ministry. And by the way, you might sit there today and think, well, I'm not in full-time service as we call it. I'm not in the ministry, but the truth is we're all in the ministry. We've been saved for a ministry, and there's something that God called us to do, our Creator equipped us to do and put us here to do, and so we ought to be doing it thankfully. There's these illustrations, and of course, the greatest example of thankfulness, I think, in the Bible we find is our Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, there were, uh, there were those in his day who were proud. There were those who displayed humility. And Christ was even thankful for the humble. We read this in Matthew eleven twenty five 25. As he prays, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. He said, there are some who get it and some who don't, and you'd never guess it's this one or that one, but I thank you, Father. He was thankful for that humility. He was thankful for a number of other things. As you turn back to John chapter 6, we, we find the uh, recording in the Bible of him feeding the 5,000. And what went with that feeding of the 5,000? You might know of the miracle, and you might pass over this, but we find out that the Lord Jesus Christ purposely did something before he fed them. In John 6, in verse number 11, <clears throat> it says, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. Don't miss that. When he had given thanks. Look in John chapter 11, if you would. Here we find him at the, the raising of Lazarus. And once again, what does he do? In John 11, and in verse 41, it says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. You know, if you, if you go through the four Gospels and you follow Christ, you find him thanking a lot. You find him at the Last Supper thanking the Lord and before going to the cross and uh, even uh, knowing his disciples were going to desert him, he was still thankful. He was thankful continually, continually. He's an illustration of thankfulness. Thirdly, let's talk, however, about the inhibition of thankfulness. In other words, hindrances, things that inhibit us, things that are, are obstacles, and they interfere in, and they obstruct us having thankful attitudes. They, they encumber us from being grateful. Look in Romans chapter 1, if you would. And I want to show you how serious, how incredibly serious it is not to be grateful. In Romans chapter 1, we find some things mentioned in verse 24 about the steps down that, that mankind takes, that society takes when they're not grateful, when, when they get away from God. And it, it actually leads to the bottom rung of the ladder, sodomy. It's mentioned, or at least referred to, implied to, in verses 26 through, through uh, 29. <clears throat> and we, we find out, as we pick it up in verse 29, where it all begins. It says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now that's a nasty list, isn't it? And, and you go, ooh, what a, what, a, what a hard, what a rogue description of our society, of any society. But I want to point out to you where it all began. I want you to back up to verse 21. Where did this all start? Well, verse 21 says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither 
were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and then you just follow the steps downward from there to degradation. It starts, however, I think with verse 21, neither were thankful. They failed to show appreciation. Now, <clears throat> that's our flesh. That is the natural man. That is how we naturally are. By nature, we're really not grateful. We have so much in this country, and, and uh, yet we, we are so uh, ungrateful for it. And, and, and people go through the week and go through life with attitudes, honking in traffic and stealing parking spots and, and not saying thank you, and, and on and on it goes. That is human nature. Why are we not thankful? What are the inhibitions to, to us being thankful? What, what are the obstacles and the hindrances and the things that encumber us from being thankful? Well, let me give you several. First of all, foolish comparison. Foolish comparison. Comparing ourselves with, with others can make us ungrateful. We find <clears throat> Christ gives a parable over in Matthew 20 of this, uh, this landlord who who hires people to go into his vineyard for the day. And you remember the story. He hires some, some guys around 6 in the morning, and he says, I'll give you a penny if you work all day, which was really a day's wages back in those days. And they go gratefully, and they get to work. And about 9 in the morning, he goes to the market square again. He sees other men standing around. He said, uh, why don't you go work in the vineyard? I'll give you what's ever fair at the end of the day. He does it at noon and 3 again. And finally, at 5 in the afternoon, an hour before quitting time, he goes into that marketplace again, sees some guys just kind of hanging around. He says, how come you guys aren't working? Well, nobody hired us. And he says, well, just go work, and I'll give you whatever's fair at the end of the day. So an hour later, he calls all the workers in, and he starts with those who started at 5 o'clock. He gives them that day's wages, a penny. And boy, those who started at 6 in the morning, they're going, ho, 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 boss is in a generous mood today. If they're getting a penny, wait till you see what we get. Well, he gives them all a penny. And afterwards, we find this as Christ is telling the parable in Matthew 20 and in verse 11. When they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house. And you say, well, why? Because they were comparing themselves. They thought, well, if they got that, I should get this. And now they're disgruntled, and now they're unthankful. Don't compare yourself. God help us not to compare ourselves. You know, you can get disgruntled if you compare yourself with your neighbor's job or your neighbor's house or your neighbor's spouse or uh, your neighbor's car. And if we do those things, we are setting ourselves up for ingratitude. And that's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Folks, we can become very ungrateful if we start comparing ourselves to others and measuring ourselves by them. It, it breeds a spirit of ingratitude. And I think many times we're guilty of it. Now, we can understand that in unbelievers, the lost, but, but what about us as God's people? Help us to guard against this. May God help us in this area. And so we see that, co that foolish comparison can make us ungrateful. But secondly, discontentment can make us ungrateful. Look, if you would, in 2 Timothy. Just turn forward to the epistle of 2 Timothy and the 6th chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 6. We will be discontented people if we are continually thinking that we deserve better or that we deserve more. And, and really, it... It's where the seeds of a welfare mentality begin, that I, uh, I would like that going to, I want that going to, I demand that, and, and being discontented if we don't get it. Woe be to you if I don't get it, and getting that kind of a mentality. Well, look what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and in verse number 6, let's pick it up there, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, notice, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So it tells us here what we, uh, what we really should seek. It's a pretty short list. Verse 7 says we brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. I've said many times you'll never find a U-Haul following a hearse because you're not going to carry anything out, right? Now, notice what verse 8 says. 
and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. That's a pretty short list, isn't it? Food and raiment, be content. Anything else is a bonus. Anything else is a blessing. God help us not to be discontented. It will, it will inhibit us from being thankful. Now there's something else that inhibits our thankfulness, and that is what I called unfulfilled expectations. Uh, those of you who are married, if, you, if you're continually expecting something of your spouse, you're going to get let down. And, and maybe you're sitting here today and you've been let down. Maybe there's kids sitting here today and your expectations from your parents haven't come through or, or parents, your expectations of your kids haven't come through or of the preacher or of the church or of God or whatever it might be. If we have these expectations, they're not going to be fulfilled all the time. We expect something to happen, but it doesn't happen. And suddenly, we're discontented, uh, we're ungrateful. There's a guy in the Bible by the name of Naaman. He was the leper, remember back there in the Old Testament? And, and Naaman was told by a little, a little is, Israelite girl, a little servant girl, a little maid, that if, if she'd just go to the prophet of Israel, that, or he'd go to the prophet of Israel, his leprosy could be cured. And so he goes there thinking, oh, Elisha's going to come out. He's going to call down fire and, and clap his hands, and it'll, it'll thunder and lightning, and, and something spectacular will happen. And the prophet just simply says, go dip in the Jordan seven times. And boy, Naaman's upset because he had some expectations, didn't he? And this isn't the way he expected it to play out. And so he's all ticked off, and he almost doesn't get healed of his leprosy as a result of it. Unfulfilled expectations. I remember when I was about this high and Christmas was rolling around and on TV they were advertising these Hot Wheel loop-to-loop -loop <coughs> track things with a little thing that whipped it through and over the orange track and around the loop-to-loop -loop. and of course they, they make it look great on TV. So I started dropping little subtle hints around mom. Well, you know, that, that would really be nice to get, you know, uh -huh. and everything but, but asking for it. And apparently she didn't get it because when Christmas rolled around, I got a Viewmaster instead. Remember that? You just said, well, I, just, I couldn't hide my disappointment. Why? Because I had some unfulfilled expectations. God help us. You know what? We'd be really best to just expect nothing. Expect nothing. And then if we get something, praise the Lord. But don't expect it. We read this in Luke 17, 10. Jesus says, so likewise ye... When you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Basically saying, when you've done everything you should do, don't expect a pat on the back. Don't expect an attaboy or a commendation. I mean, if it comes, great. But really have the attitude, I just did what I should do. I just did my duty. Anything you get after that is grace. It's grace. And so careful with the comparing careful with the discontented, uh, careful with the unfulfilled uh, expectations. These are things that will inhibit our gratitude. Now, there's something else, and, and this is the one I really have to work with, and it's, it's called busyness. Being too busy to stop and thank God, to smell the roses, to notice the full moon last night, whatever it might be, but, but we just get like a pinball, just, bling, 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 just all over the place, and we get so busy that we really don't stop and we're not grateful. We don't stop to think. Uh, we don't stop to consider. There was a, a church like this following the war, the big war, World War II, that was having a building program and, and uh, needing money and raising it in a stewardship fund drive. And, and there was a, a couple in the church that had lost a son in the war. And as a memorial to him, they donated a, a good sum of money to the, the, the church building project. There was another couple in the church that heard about it and decided after prayer that they were going to do the same thing, kind of quietly. But the preacher heard about it and went to that other couple and said, now I can understand why they gave a large sum. They lost a son in war. But your son came home. And they said, that's exactly right. Why is it that those who have lost something can give and those who have retained it don't? They said, we at the least should give that or, or more. And, and they were thinking. You know, sometimes we're just not thinking. And as a result, we're not thankful. Thankfulness is thankfulness. And that's why we sing songs like Count Your Blessings, name them one by one. Because as we do, oh, okay, there's one to thank God for. The psalmist put it this way in Psalm 107.1. Oh, 
Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. We see the inhibitions to thankfulness, but fourthly, let's talk about the issues or the reasons. Turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and this is real practical. Why should we be thankful to God? Well, I think the most obvious thing that comes to mind is for his provision, for the way he meets needs, and, and he supplies, and the bounty that he affords us. We see here in 2 Corinthians 9, and in verse number 11, it says, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving to God. Notice as we, we rejoice in his bountifulness, in his provision, we are thankful. So what kind, of, what kind of thing should we be thankful for? Well, back to 2 Thessalonians again. There's some obvious ones, and we could talk about those, you know, food and clothing and all that. But let's look at some less obvious ones, one that we're, we're, we're prone to overlook here. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we find that, that Paul, writing back to this suffering church, is so grateful. Why? Because they sent him some huge love offering or something? No, nothing like that. He's so thankful that they're enduring it. They're going through it, that they're growing in the midst of it, that they're doing well spiritually. When is the last time you've been really excited and blessed and thankful because of another Christian's spiritual well-being? Their growth. You know, we find that John said, I have no greater joy than to know that my children do well in the Lord. And by the way, if, if you're in ministry, that's really what causes you to rejoice and you to be thankful. Look here in, in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3. Paul says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet or fit or appropriate, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Paul says, I'm just gushing about this. I'm so excited. I'm so thankful because your faith is growing exceedingly. You know, I, I, I got to honestly say, one of the thrills of my life is to see God's people doing well. God's people doing well spiritually. Not stubborn, not self-centered, uh, not with an attitude, not unfaithful, not simple, not any of those things, but growing and doing well spiritually because a Christian will self-destruct if we're not. Notice again verse 3. Paul says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity or the love of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. What a blessing that can be. You know, we find the Apostle Paul later on in the book of Acts. He's on trial, and he's uh, possibly going to die in the midst of it. But in Acts 28, 15, it says, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum, and the three taverns whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. This was so encouraging to him. What a wonderful practice Paul had, by the way, to just be grateful in the midst of all those things. So you can be thankful for provision. You can be thankful when Christians are doing well spiritually. Thirdly, you can be thankful for your local church. We read this in Psalm 100, verse 4, to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Did you come into God's house today thankful, grateful for the local church that God's given you? Because there are a lot of places in this world, most places in this world, that don't have one. We can take a lot of things for granted. God help me never to take the local church for granted. You know, when, when the Bible speaks of, 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 of leaving your first love, that just might be what it's talking about. I'll tell you, I fell in love with the local church the night I got saved. I've been in love with it ever since, and I thank God for it. And I do try to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and be thankful unto him. And maybe for some of you here, the, the sheen might, might be wearing off. God help you to, to keep that, that area of your life in check. Now, there's a fourth thing that we can be thankful for, and that is the privilege to give back to God a portion of that which he has given to us. We don't really think about this, but it mentions in 1 Corinthians or Chronicles 29, 14. Here's David. He's talking about building the house of God. And he says, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer 
so willingly after this sword. For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. That's the attitude to have, by the way. God, you gave it all to me. What a privilege it is to be able to give back a portion to you. Thank God for that. Look in Philippians, just a few pages back. Philippians chapter 1. There's something else that we can be thankful for, and that is just the wonderful, heartwarming events of life and the memories that God gives to us. And, and in the 30 years or so I've been pastoring this church, there's a plethora of them. I couldn't begin to talk about them. Notice in Philippians 1, Paul had the same mindset. In verse 3, he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Just remembering the blessings, remembering the times, and thanking God for them. You know, when God brought the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, he led them out with a high hand. And I, I just picture that night as they marched out of slavery. The Bible says it was a night to be remembered. Wow. It was a night to be remembered. And then God taught them songs and other things afterwards to help them to remember those things so that they would keep that grateful attitude. Because remember where it starts? The slide, the slippery slope down, really, to the degradation that we see in this society today starts up here with no longer being thankful. And boy, I'll tell you what, even God's people need to watch it. We need to be thankful people. Thank God for the wonderful memories. I'm a memory guy. I, I, could, I could stand here for, for months talking about things, but God has given us so many wonderful memories. Thank God for those. Now, something else we ought to thank God for, and that is our, our loved ones, our loved ones. I've said many times, the whole world can beat me down, but if I still got my family, I thank God for that. Is your family something you're thankful for, your loved ones? Back in World War II when Hitler was terrorizing the Jewish people during the Holocaust and, and hauling them into the prison camps and then to the, the death chambers, there was a, a Jewish man by the name of Solomon Rosenberg who was brought into a concentration camp with his family. And the instructions to him, his wife, and their two sons were real simple. As long as you can keep working, you'll live. As soon as you can no longer live, you go to the gas chamber. Well, they starved him to death there. So it, it's like a matter of time. And, and barely with any rations at all to eat, the four of them split up into four different directions every day and, and, and they worked them to the bone and at night they had set up to meet at a particular place and, and night after night the four of them would meet up there still strong enough to keep working and they'd huddle together and hug and, and thank God for another day of life and, and then get separated the next day and, and uh, that night come back and, and, and be able to hug and have a family reunion. This went on for some time and, until finally... One night, Solomon showed up, and, and he saw his son Joshua there just sobbing off to the side after finding him. And, and he said, Joshua, Joshua, you're okay? And he said, yes, Daddy. He, he said, but what, what's wrong? He said, David, it's David. He just couldn't work anymore. He's just too weak. He's passed out and, and coming to and passing out and coming to, and, and, and they've, they've taken him off. And Solomon said, but where's your mother? She said, well, David was afraid. Mom said, I'll go with you. We take so much for granted when it comes to our families, don't we? We ought to thank God for them. Thank God for every night where you come home, you have that reunion, or every day where you can pick up that phone and get in contact with those who call you mom or dad, your son, your daughter, your wife. Never take them for granted. God help us. We see the things, the issues that we should be thankful for the initiation, the illustrations, the inhibitions, finally the implementing of thanksgiving. Now, turn to Philippians 4. You're so close. I want to show you something here about thanksgiving that is very important. It's quite often tied to prayer. Have you ever noticed that as you read the Bible? It's, it's linked. It's coupled. It's like a, a, a kissing cousin to prayer. In Philippians 4 and in verse 6, the Bible says, Be careful for nothing. Not, not meaning cautious, careful, but full of care. Don't be full of care about anything. Don't be anxious for anything. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In my morning devotion time, uh, there's a time of praise. There's a time of confession. There's obviously a time of asking because you haven't prayed until you've asked. 
But one of the four elements I think are very important is a time of thanksgiving. Notice it's, it's coupled here with prayer. Again in verse 6 it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer with supplication, or in supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Those, those ought to go with each other. They ought to accompany each other. We read in Colossians 4 and in verse 2 to continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So thanksgiving and prayer go together and let's just throw praise in there. We saw it already. Therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God continually that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Now maybe you're going through it. Maybe it's hard to praise and thank the Lord during problems and trials and valleys. But you know, oftentimes that's what God is waiting for. That is a turning point. The man Jonah hit bottom. And in his case, the bottom of a whale. He was swallowed. He had a bad attitude and God took him to the woodshed. It was old whale university, as it were. And he learned in the school of hard knocks. And there he is in the, the midst of that whale. And uh, he was grumbling, he was complaining, and there's seaweed around his head and all that. But he had an attitude adjustment. He got his heart right. He began to praise and thank God. And we read in Jonah 2 and verse 9, he says, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Meaning it's hard to do. Now watch what happened. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. He spent three days grumbling, but when he turned it around, he thanked God and he praised, it reversed the thing. I wonder how many of us are extending those problems with our attitude when we should be thanking and praising and watching the reversal take place. You know, the Jewish people out there in the wilderness wandering, they spent 40 years grumbling. And, and the thing never did get better, did it, until they're all dead. God help us for it not to take that long. Now, notice, if you would, in 2 Corinthians 9, 15. The Bible simply says, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. What's this talking about now? It's talking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and Calvary's cross. Our Lord and Savior going to Calvary, shedding blood for our sins so that we could be saved by placing all of our faith in what he did on the cross. Are you thankful to God for his unspeakable gift? If you're going to heaven, are you thankful to God for your unspeakable future, your eternity? Colossians 1.12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. Friend, can you count your blessings? Can I count my blessings? I got this in an email from somebody recently. I'll just read it quickly before we close. It says, even though I clutch my blankets and groan when the alarm rings each morning, thank you, Lord, that I can hear there are those who are deaf. Even though I keep my eyes tightly closed against the morning light as long as possible, thank you, Lord, that I can see there are many who are blind. <clears throat> even though I huddle in my bed and put off the physical effort of rising, thank you, Lord, that I have the strength to rise, there are many who are bedfast. Even though the first hour of my day is hectic, when socks are lost, toast is burned, tempers are short, thank you, Lord, for my family, there are many who are lonely. Even though our table never looks like the pictures in the magazines and the menu is at times unbalanced, thank you, Lord, for the food we have, there are many who are hungry. And even though the routine of my job is often monotonous, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to work, there are many who have no work. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. God help us. If, 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 if you're a, a, a Christian today, I've got to ask you this. Are you happy? Is there a peace in your heart? Because if, if, if you're going to have a peace and a love and a joy, thanksgiving is the pathway to that. We read in Colossians 3.15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Be thankful. God help us in everything to give thanks. Let's stand to our feet, please. I'd like to ask that our heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning as we give a word of invitation. Throughout this month, as we head into the holiday season, and the first being what we call Thanksgiving, we're taking each Lord's Day and the Sunday morning service to talk about gratitude, talk about being thankful. And I want us week after week here to examine ourselves and, 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 and really do a cross-check and an analysis within spiritually and be honest 
and determine whether we truly are a grateful Christian. Because you can cultivate anything. You can cultivate a, a, an attitude of ingratitude, of murmuring, complaining, and, and just being ungrateful. Or you can cultivate really a sweet spirit, and one of, of joy and peace and gratitude, depending on what we do. Father, we come before thee now this morning. We thank you so much for the blessings that are ours. Thank you for the privilege that we have to live at this time in history, to experience these mountains and these valleys, and to be able to say, God created me for such a time as this, for this generation. And truly the day will come and it'll be soon enough when we'll be gone. So help us while we're here to make a difference and Father, to go through life grateful. Lord, I pray for those who are here and haven't really embraced your unspeakable gift, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I ask you to bring them today to that saving knowledge of Christ through repentance of sin and faith in our Savior. For we ask it in his name. Amen. With our heads